So a question from Lori. How do you explain to a diehard non-believer how and why you believe God is real? A person who has read all sorts of books discrediting the truth of God. Well, I would want to make a distinction between how I know personally, you know, within me, the subjective versus the objective content of Christianity. And I'd probably want to move the discussion more into the objective content of Christianity. Um, Obviously, why I believe it's true is because God saved me, God Mm -hmm. changed my heart, God gave me faith and repentance. That's an experience the atheist doesn't have. And he hears that and he thinks, well, you know, that's all fine and well for you, but it does nothing in terms of, you know, his breaking down his resistance to the scripture. So I think ultimately when we when we discuss truth with an atheist, the idea is, is that we not convince him of our religious experience, but the, the truth content of Christianity. And I would say that the, one of the things that we do First is recognize the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 argues from the effect or the creation to the creator. In other words, Paul basically says when we look out in the world around us, it resonates that God made, that God created, that God is the one who put all these things into place. So I would definitely use that tact with that particular person, try to preach or teach or tell him that there is a God who is responsible for everything that we see around us. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, then I would start leading into the realm or the categories of special revelation, you know, who Jesus is, what the purpose for Jesus coming is. And I think that oftentimes, you know, atheists, if they've heard the gospel, it hasn't been, you know, a good, robust explanation. You know, in my experience dealing with irreligious or non-religious people, and, you know, I've, I've talked to them and they'll say things like, you know, I grew up in a church, I've been to church, and I, I never heard that before. Now, I'm not a PhD. I'm not the rocket scientist. That's not the point. The point is that they're getting very shallow, shallow, vapid approaches to Christianity. And I, I think we're not doing ourselves any favors when we can't articulate the truth of what we believe. So I'd want to move it out of the realm of my subjective belief in Jesus or God to the objective certainty of Christianity as it's revealed in Holy Scripture. Yeah, I think just uh, piggybacking off of that, I think, you know, Paul does in Acts 17 and Acts 14, he does argue from the light of nature and the fact that all in him we live and move and have our being. But so we move from the realm of general revelation that there is there is a God, uh, but then we go to show by way of special revelation who this God is and what he uh, has done in Christ Jesus. And so the reality is only God can change their, mm. change their minds and hearts, but certainly we can... Uh, reason from the light of nature and scripture with them and hope and pray that that he works in them. I would say in light of the Acts 17 reference, you know, when you're talking to an atheist or somebody that is avowed, an avowed opponent of God and his gospel, never underestimate the ethical element. You know, oh, well, I've studied this, the, the truth of Christianity and have realized that it's just fake, it's false. I've studied the philosophical systems of the world, and I have determined there can sound like an intellectualism and a healthy, you know, skepticism. Sometimes it's just ethical. Sometimes people love to sin. You know, when we look at Acts 17, what drove Paul to preach the way Paul preached at the Areopagus? Well, when he comes to Athens, it says that his spirit is provoked within him because the city was given over to idols. So in his preaching, he doesn't leave that undealt with. He makes sure he hammers them on the fact that they were idolaters. You know, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost to Jerusalem sinners. This wasn't just a question of, does Jesus check off the boxes as the Messiah promised in the Old Testament? No, he says in 236, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised up. He's made him both Lord and Christ. So the person that says, well, I'm an intellectual, I've got a PhD, and Christianity is just so much nonsense. Hey, what's your girlfriend's name? What what kind of bank bank account have you comprised from theft? 
I'm not saying you necessarily challenge them in this way, but there's an ethical dimension. Man in sin doesn't come yep. to the light, John 3. The darkness doesn't come to the light because it doesn't want its darkness exposed. So I, you know, I don't say go ahead and hammer them on every sin they've ever thought, but realize there is an ethical dimension. It's not just intellectual. Yep. I disagree with the truth of Christianity. Yeah, but you've got a prejudice against it already because you love sin. Yeah. I was Ray Comfort has the thousands of videos where he does this. He always starts right. with creation, right? Look at the wonder of the human eye and like, how could that have happened? That's right. And everything in, and things like this table didn't exist without being created. That's right. This room, the studio didn't That's get right. created without some man thinking it and putting it together. That's right. Um, and then he gets into, have you stolen? Have you lied? That's right. Have yeah. you looked at a woman with lust? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Those are, it's a good approach. Yeah. Yeah. But one, one final thing though, is that, I, and I appreciate that approach, but I, I think that we're always looking for the approach. Mm. We always want the formula. Well, how do I speak? You know what? People are people. Everybody's got their own background. They've got their own present. They've got their own challenges, their own issues. So, you know, when we come to, you know, the defense of the faith or Christian apologetics, or when we come to, you know, the, these issues of what about this person— it's hard to pigeonhole that, you know, there's, there's so many different things and there's been so many approaches in Christian apologetics. Well, if you don't do it this way, you're not really doing it at all. If you don't come to it this way, then you're not doing it right. I just don't see it that way. I see, you know, flexibility. I see, mm -hmm. you know, difference in the way that persons are treated and handled by persons in the New Testament. You know, the way that Jesus speaks to the religious leaders is a lot more stern and harsh than he speaks to the woman at the well. Yep. Um, the Apostle Paul, as Mike said, Acts 14, Acts 17, he highlights the fact that God is creator. Why is that? Because it's a Gentile or pagan or heathen audience that didn't have that concept of Yahweh as creator. When he's in the synagogues, he usually isn't discoursing about creation. He's usually telling them that Jesus is the Messiah. So this idea that evangelism and apologetics must always look like this, I don't think it's helping anybody. I think it, it, it creates a burden. It creates pride on the part of those who do, it, do, do do it that way. And it just, I think, keeps people from just talking to sinners. You know, at, at, in the final analysis, what's evangelism and what's apologetics? Talking to sinners, telling them the truth about God's holiness, their sinfulness, and the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Mm. So when we formula, make it formulaic or we make it a, a system or we have this method, the method becomes more important than the sinner that we're talking to. <laughs> you know, mm. I, I want to evangelize, Pastor. Go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Yeah. I want to defend the faith. Well, I'd say learn the faith well. I'd say that with evangelism. And then defend the faith. Just live. You'll get plenty of opportunities to evangelize and do apologetics. And that seems to be Peter's emphasis in 1 Peter 3, where we get that word for defense. Uh, he says, be ready to give an answer uh, for the faith uh, when you're asked. The, the asking seems to be implied and the context seems to be uh, when you're suffering and when you're going through it, you're not whining or grumbling or complaining. Yeah, you're, you're acting like Christ. Uh, in that moment, and Christ will give his people the strength they need in those moments to act in such a way. And, and then that can be the platform for which we then share the gospel with others. But that's something all can do. What has Christ done for me? That is the message of, of hope that seems to be in Christ, the gospel and its uh, work in the life of the one who's speaking. And so, and even too, in Philippians 2, how do we shine as lights? We don't grumble or complain, exactly. right? We don't, be, we don't have to be jerks for Jesus. Unfortunately, I think I grumble and complain mm. uh, more than anybody. Uh, but certainly the life that we lead, uh, while it's not the gospel, yep. it's a platform uh, for us to potentially share the gospel with fellow, with, uh, with sinners. Yeah. Yeah. And John 9, that man that was born blind, that Jesus healed. And then he fa faces all that heat from the from the religious leaders. And I love that, that you know, I, basically, and I, this is the Jim Butler paraphrase, I don't know what you all are going on about, but I was blind and now I see. You know, if, if, if that's your testimony to some sinner that you meet on the subway, praise God. And of course, you tell them why now you see. It's because of Jesus, yeah. right? And I think we, we have a knack in the church to overly complicate things. 
We got to have, you know, all these different structures in place. Just go talk to people about Jesus. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. And yeah, again, we can't save people. And it's That's right. one conversation at a time, just putting up tons of pebble in their, in their shoe. That's right. right. Something to think about. That's right. It's what happened with us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 